Director of the BBC will join us, as will Lawrence Donegan, who reckons this is Rory's year, and we'll have Keith Wood looking ahead to the weekend's rugby. 53106 is the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. You're very welcome. I'm joined in studio by Kieran Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star. Good evening. Good evening. You are technically on holiday, and yet you sat through this seven-hour Eroctus committee. Yeah, uh, it's one of the days that should make you question your life choices, really, if that's, if that's what you're doing on your holiday. And your, your only, only day off since Christmas, really. So You're not getting it back here, on No, no, but... Uh, to be honest, I was genuinely interested as well, but it's strange, like, when you go into sports journalism, people people always throw the same thing at you. Oh, you get into games for free and you do a lot of travel and stuff. But a lot of the time you end up in committee rooms in Ireland or, you know, watching these kind of hearings because there was a sense of deja vu. Like, there's been a lot of this with the FAI before. It's been there in the Olympic Council. It's been there with athletics governing bodies under various guises, with, with swimming. Yeah with uh, GA, with the rugby at different times. Like it's, and it's, you do see familiar themes, like there's a lot of hubris, there's a lot of arrogance, there's a sense of entitlement with some people. Yeah. And it's very, very hard to get straight answers. Mm. And even after today, <laughs> I thought it wasn't, like uh, up to lunchtime, I thought this is a complete waste of time, but some stuff did come out of it that made it worthwhile, I thought, you know. Yeah, there's no doubt the TDs and Senators, some of them, some of them, I hasten to add, were on the on their game. Yeah. Whereas there were others, frankly, that ranged from incompetent to just embarrassing. Yeah, and like it, it was very striking, like that you like the ones, maybe the standout performer was Jonathan O'Brien, Sinn Fein TD from Cork, but he was very much involved in Cork City mm. for years, so he knows the game, and he knows the politics of it, and he knew the, he knew the significance of the loan and what that loan could be related to which a lot of other people didn't really get or, or you know, there was, there was a bit of grandstanding for some, but there was, there was a few good contributors and, you know, we, we're, we're going to come to all that. But. Yeah, so that is the plan. We're not going to have the news round as usual this evening. We're just going to take you through this Oireachtas Committee. It started at 10 a.m. Now, look, I'm acutely uh, conscious this might seem a bit excessive and I appreciate lots of you will just want to hear pre-match stuff around Manchester and Barcelona and I'll give you the teams in a second, but this is actually really important as I'm sure the vast majority of you appreciate we are very conscious that we were able to watch the seven hours and that most of you had better things frankly to be doing so some of this will not be fireworks and jazz hands and we appreciate that but we're talking about taxpayers money both going to the FAI and actually frankly to some of the TDs and senators involved as well and we think it's worth doing so we're going to do that between now and eight o'clock and uh, too often I think in public life the first tactic is to muddy the waters and make things so confusing to just make it drawn out and complicated and put people off paying close attention. So we're going to try and give you a good summary of what happened today. This thing started at 10 a.m. Uh, things kicked off with Donald Conway, president of the FAI, reading his opening remarks into the record. Now, you'll remember we did see that statement on Monday. It was, I don't know, was it leaked or was it just deliberately sent around? But everybody had this on Monday. There was nothing new there. It's quite a long statement. Then it emerged that John Delaney, who was sitting to Donald Conway's left, had a prepared statement of his own. And this prompted an adjournment because John Delaney, unlike Donald Conway, the FAI president, had not submitted this evidence prior to the committee, which is very much the protocol. And this caused all sorts of consternation. And they had to go back into private session to read John Delaney's statement. And then eventually, and we're talking well over an hour after proceedings began, we did finally hear the opening prepared remarks from John Delaney. On Tuesday the 25th of April 2017, we had an internal finance meeting at the FAI. This meeting was attended by our Director of Finance, Eamon Breen, our Financial Controller, uh, Yvonne Tong, and myself as CEO. I was advised at this meeting that if all cheques and FAI bank transfers issued to third parties at that time were presented for payment, that the FAI would exceed its overdraft limit of 1.5 million on its bank accounts, which were held with Bank of Ireland. At the meeting, I expressed concern and surprise as to how the FAI could have arrived at this position. I recall thinking at a time, if I had been approached even a few days earlier, I may have been able to better address this issue. I asked if any funds were due to the FAI which could resolve the matter. I was informed that there was nothing due imminently that could be confirmed at that stage. 
As the matter was pressing, and we only had a few hours to resolve the potential issues that would arise if the bank overdraft limit was exceeded, as a precautionary measure and to assist the FAI, I wrote a cheque for €100,000 from my personal account to the FAI. This cheque was made payable to the FAI. I gave it to our Director of Finance, Eamon Breen, telling him to only lodge the cheque if it became clear that the bank overdraft was going to be exceeded. On Monday the 4th of March 2019, I informed the Board of the FAI of the precautionary payment I had made following a media query received from the Sunday Times. On Saturday, the 16th of March 2019, I initiated court proceedings at the Sunday t against the Sunday Times at my own cost in relation to this matter because I believed at the time that this information had emanated from documentation which had been filed in the family courts. I accept that the overdraft limit issue arose on my watch as Chief Executive Officer. I wish that it had not happened, but I acted in the best interests of the Association. I regret the embarrassment that this entire issue has caused to them and the Association, but I did it in the best interests of football. On legal advice, I'm precluded from making any further comments at this hearing in relation to the finances of the Association or my former role as CEO or the 100,000 payment either directly or indirectly. In the interests of fair procedures and natural justice, which I have made this statement to the committee, and have attended this meeting voluntarily, as I've attended many Oireachtas committees in the past, I am not in a position to answer any such questions here at this time. Given that some members of this committee have made highly prejudicial public pronouncements about me personally, prior to my attendance here today, and in light of the recent Supreme Court hearing or ruling in the Cairns case, I would ask that the committee respects this position. I am, as most of you would know, passionate about football and have always been. So they were John Delaney's opening remarks. We did wonder, would he refuse to comment on the loan and various issues for legal reasons? And he made it very clear in his opening remarks that that was his intention. Mm -hmm. So they were the opening statements and then we moved to the questioning section and first up was Catherine Murphy, TD, and her question was about the €100,000 loan. So you heard there, uh, John Delaney said he asked Eamon Breen regarding the loan at the time about his obligation to disclose the loan and to report the loan and to make it public knowledge. So Murphy wanted to pick up on this. She wanted to know what was said when he asked Eamon Breen about his obligation. And as you'll hear, this is very early on. This is basically Murphy's first question. It became very apparent that John Delaney was absolutely serious when he said he would not be answering these types of questions. Just to clear one thing up, Mr Delaney, um, you, you said you recall uh, asking the Director of Finance, did the, uh, the FAA have any reporting or disclosure obligations arising out of the €100,000 payment? Can you recall the response to that? I've made it clear in my statement, Deputy Murphy, that I can't add, add any further to that at this given the stage, given the various investigations that are okay. taking place. So, there you are. Fairly clear terms, no questions being answered regarding the €100,000 loan. Just to emphasise this newly established dynamic, I want to skip on, we'll come back to Catherine Murphy in a moment, but I want to skip on 20 or 30 minutes. So, at this point, we're in the midst of some financial chat and Robert Troy, the TD, wanted to ask a question to John Delaney about uh, Bray Wanderers. So, as you'll hear here, not only was John Delaney most certainly not answering questions relating to the €100,000 loan, it became apparent that any questions relating to his 14 years as CEO would not be answered. Last year, Bray Wanderers, a historical club, uh, nearly went to its knees. Um, why was there not a need to help them? When Bray Wanderers presented... No, that was Mr Delaney, actually. Well, can I take this, please? When Bray Wanderers... Well, I, I, I actually... In fairness, he's entitled to Mr Delaney's open to other questions, so I think he should answer Well, I think questions. he said, Mr Chairman, that questions in relation to his former role as CEO, which um, that would come under, I think in his statement he said he, that sorry, he did not wish to take those questions. 
question. I'll just clarify that. What? Okay, no, I accept that. Sorry, apologies. I know he's happy to answer other questions into his present role. Excuse me. No, you're right. Mr. Lenny, you don't have to answer that question. Yeah. That last voice there is Fergus O'Dowd, chair of the committee, who, by the way, will be in studio after nine o'clock. And it was Donald Conway, the FAI president, speaking on John Delaney's behalf, saying he has said he's not answering those questions. So, Kieran Cunningham, when we're looking at today, that's one of the real headline pieces of news that John Delaney effectively did not want to answer questions about the loan, but equally, as cited legal reasons precluding him from answering questions about his previous role, which happened to be 14, 15 years mm. as CEO. That's a big headline from well, today. Absolutely. Well, that was one of the, the one of the main interests people had in, in this committee and what would happen today was John Delaney. Like, what would John Delaney have to say for himself? And he said very little because he had this screen in front of him and said, you, you know, nobody's allowed past it. You know, I have this legal basis that you can't question me. But it was selective. There was a couple of questions he did ask, like around... Uh, Genesis and, and the implementation of Genesis that did refer, relate to yeah. his time as chief executive. And he seemed to be cherry picking things that might have made him look a bit good from his time as CEO, in my opinion. So. He certainly did answer a few other questions, but they did seem to be ones that were to his liking. And equally, he did say in his opening statement he'd answer anything relating to UEFA or FIFA business. Mm. But that was very much the tone. So Catherine Murphy tried initially to ask him about the loan. You heard just there that Robert Troy tried to ask him about something to do with Bray Wanderers when he was CEO. They were all off limits. So we'll go back to Catherine Murphy's opening salvo then. Uh, John Delaney, in his opening statement, said that the issue of the loan in 2017 uh, did not arise at a board meeting the following week or two, as if this was beyond his control. But he said it didn't, simply didn't arise. And so what we learned today was that the FAI board except for three members, the FAI board, except for three members, knew nothing about the €100,000 loan until March of this year. So the meeting, um, this strikes a lot of people as, as extraordinary, including Catherine Murphy. And so here she is talking about this situation to the FAI president, Donald Conway. Normally, what you would expect to see would be that something like that would be minuted, um, and those minutes then, in turn, would be uh, would be given to the auditors at the end of the year, and then things are captured because th that is the case. So that didn't happen. We do get financial reporting, obviously, at every yeah, monthly but the, board this, meeting. This specific um, the hundred thousand didn't. Uh, on the didn't occasion happen. of the hundred thousand, it wasn't discussed at the board. That's correct. Right, and I mean. In terms of governance, um, that would be, you know, you were in a very uh, precarious situation, you'd exceeded your, um, you'd exceeded your, your, your overdraft. Potentially. Um, or or you, were, you potentially exceeded your overdraft and um, you had to take this, these extraordinary measures. Yet something as extraordinary as that and the precarious nature of it, which puts you into uh, trouble with the uh, with Sports Ireland in terms of of an obligation of you letting Sports Ireland know that your finances had significantly deteriorated. Uh, that is not something then that was uh, that, you, that 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 it was felt that the board should know. But wh why didn't it happen on on this occasion when you were in uh, you were in a, a position where uh, you were likely to exceed your overdraft and have to take an extraordinary uh, or a very unusual measure. If, if I might say, and I do reference it in my statement, that our finances can be quite cyclical. It was managed out of sight of the board. It was managed in the way that it was managed and it's not something we would like to see. It's not a process that we... Like, how, how could Sport Ireland, for example, have confidence um, that, you know, public money that is provided, um, where there's terms and conditions associated with that, and it's part of the reason why they have suspended um, the, the payment. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely astonished that this is the way that um, the, the FAI would have conducted um, their, their business at, at, this, at this particular point. Yes, yeah, so that was Catherine Murphy in one of the opening questions. It was managed the way it was managed, yeah. <laughs> is the line from the FAI President Donald Conway, and she responded, it was managed out of sight. And that is new information that we had today, because we didn't know the circumstances. So the board, bar three members, knew nothing about this at the time. Yeah. And it wasn't until March of this year when the Sunday Times started looking into it with information that 
it was disclosed to... Yeah. Including the Treasurer, the FAI didn't know about it, which I think something like that would be a relevance to the Treasurer, Eddie Murray, who uh, he had a few interventions that were interesting about uh, just how the FAI operates, and you'd wonder who ultimately makes the calls there. Yeah. Like some people do, seem to have titles that don't have much significance. Well, there is a point later on where the honorary treasurer is asked how many bank accounts yeah. the FAI has. And he, he said, I think it's one, or something like that, but then it turns out it's 24. Yeah. You know, so. There was a period of consultation, they had to go and check, yeah. and instead of the uh, one, which the honorary treasurer thought it might be, it turned out there were 24. Yeah. So that was Catherine Murphy. Next to Imelda Munster. L last week, you'll remember, she asked John Tracy four times if Sport Ireland had faith in the FAI board. Uh, this week, Imelda Munster, are the FAI giving everybody the two fingers? It appears that you, you're giving, and I'm saying it appears that you're giving the two fingers to not just Sport Ireland, not just the Transport Committee, not just Grassroots FAI, sporting clubs. I mean, you'd have to agree. I would not agree with that, <laughs> the last part of your statement, mm. uh, Deputy. Do you think that given all of that that's come to light, that it was appropriate to create a new position for your former CEO? I'm asking you on the base, do you actually think that that is good governance? In your opinion now, as the president of the FAI, do you think that is good governance? It send out, sends out a good message. Um, and do you think it was a decision, you know, a good decision by the board? I mean, and is that good governance? If it wasn't advertised, is that good governance? As chairman of the board, uh, deputy, the image of the FAI, of course, is important. And uh, harming that image is a matter of serious concern to us. Um, Good governance is something we want to ensure that we have in the FAI. Now, in relation to the appointment, the appointment was dictated by a series of projects, I referenced them earlier, a series of potential hosting of major international <coughs> competitions. There's no other member of the FAI, for example, who would be a member of the Executive Committee of UEFA. There's no other member of the FEI who would, for example, chair, be a chair and be a vice chair to key committees of UEFA. There's no other member of the FEI who would have a presence at FIFA. Contacts within UEFA, likewise with FIFA, was all, was all going to be a benefit to trying to manage the series of projects that we assigned to that role. Advertise, you might have discovered that there might have been somebody else out there. Well, I know who are members of UEFA Exco. I know who are members of FIFA. I know who those persons are. Mm. And I'd like to think we had lots more people, Irish people, eligible out there. So why not advertise? Because we felt there was somebody mm. who had the skill set right, right, right. that matched the role. Right, 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 says Imelda Munger. That's the uh, voice again of the FAI president. Don so, Conway. Yeah, I think it's important to challenge today. something he said there because it's, it's a line you hear a lot from them, Joe, in that uh, people who defend jo, jo, uh, John Delaney point to his influence in UEFA and to the wider football family, as they keep referencing. And it's very similar to the language we used to hear around Pat Hickey and the Olympic Council, that because he was so prominent on an international Olympic committee, that he was regarded, you kept being told that he's indispensable, we need Pat in there. Yeah. But since Pat has gone from the Olympic Council, now the Olympic Federation, Sari Keane has come in and five different people from the Irish Olympic Federation have gone on to international Olympic committees. There are other people there. Yeah. There's nobody indispensable. Like yeah. Graveyards are full of people that were regarded as indispensable. But they, they, they bought into this uh, aura around John Delaney and think everything will fall apart. We will be nothing without him, mm. you know? which well, is very dangerous. No, it's true. So this exchange, we're still in the morning section here. We've had uh, two more clips from the morning, but on that point, so Imelda Munster is saying, well, you know, should you not advertise for the position? And Donald Conway is saying, well, John Delaney is the only one with these level of contacts and as a you know, seat at UEFA and as part of FIFA. It was something Ruth Coppinger wanted to pick up on straight away. She was excellent all day, yeah. Ruth Coppinger. So she talked about this executive vice president role. She talked about the fact it wasn't advertised. And then again, you'll, he you'll hear uh, Don Conway talking up John Delaney's connections. 
Can I just ask you, you you've already said you, you, you didn't feel the necessity, the board didn't feel the necessity to have an interview for this new position because the perfect candidate already existed. Um, are you telling us today that despite all of the non-disclosure of the former CEO and others to the board, you wish to keep Mr Delaney because of his connections with UEFA and FIFA? That seems to be what you just said earlier. I wish to deploy whatever personnel we have to best effect. So Where, any other issues don't matter because of his connections with UEFA? I would like to, what I want to do is to use the assets of the association to best effect. We have a number of key projects. Who are the key or the most important personnel to work over those projects? That informed the decisions around the Jonathan Hall report. The former CEO said, I think on radio and stuff, that, or in an interview, that was because he was doing three jobs. He just wasn't able to do them, so a new position had to be created. Um, are you seriously telling us that that's the reason for this? Is it not a demotion of the former CEO? What I'm seriously telling you is that I think, going forward, having a CEO that manages, looks after, leads our executive team, that looks after the domestic game and, of course, our international teams, and then a separate position, as lots of other member associations of UEFA have, a separate, separate position of executive vice president, the board feels that that will serve the FEI better going forward. That, that will be fine, except it just happens to coincide with public revelations about this loan. The discussion That's about coincidental, is it? better arranging our senior ex executives has gone on for many months, Deputy. Like that's a key point, and we'll come back to it again. There's other interesting points, one from Noel Rock in particular. But Ruth Coppinger there is clearly saying it goes against any sense of credibility that it's just a coincidence you've yeah. created this new role around the time the Sunday Times had these revelations. It, it just does not ring true, and yet Donald Conway and the FAI delegation sat there and said that is the case. Yeah, but, well, no, absolutely. Like, if you go through everything that we're saying today, the FAI, they're, they're more or less saying, there's nothing to see here, there's, mm -hmm. no, there's no big fuss, like, move along. Yeah. But you have to remember, Sport Ireland suspended funding yesterday. There's 70, there, Sport Ireland oversees 73 national govern, governing bodies in different sports, and it's only happened a, ha a, a couple of times in the history of both Sport Ireland and Irish Sports Council that it's happened. Yeah. So it's very, very unusual. So something seems to be up. And the way, so it's very hard to buy into this thing that they're saying there's nothing, this was perfectly normal procedure. Like, you probably come to Noel Rock on the PDF thing, will you? Yes. Yeah, so I won't bring that up now, but we can reference that. Yeah, but it's a point, and that relates to the uh, Jonathan Hall Associates uh, yeah. report. But it will tie in with Ruth Coppinger there saying, so this has nothing to do with all these revelations. It's just a coincidence. Yeah. Right, key point here. This is really, really key. I do appreciate some of this is probably a bit boring, and you've better things to do between 7 and 8 o'clock of a Champions League quarterfinal, but this is really interesting. The chair of the committee, Fergus O'Dowd, this is at the end of the morning session. He emphasised several times that the general public want change within the organisation. He said that to Donald Conway. And uh, this is a key exchange. He suggested here, in a bid to restore public confidence, O'Dowd suggested a forensic audit of the FAI. And you'll hear Donald Conway's uh, response. And O'Dowd had to suggest it several times. So just listen out here. A key exchange from the morning session. This is Fergus O'Dowd, the chair of the committee, putting something to Donald Conway, FAI president. Would you do a forensic audit? Would that help build confidence of your organisation? An independent outside forensic audit, would that make a difference? And would you do it? We're doing uh, a very wide-ranging independent investigation when Mazars comes on board. A forensic audit question. The both between the Grant Thornton and the Mazars investigations, there will be very, very um, thorough examinations of the FAI. I think there's a slight difference. A forensic audit, as I understand it, a particular type of audit, and I'll just ask you, and I'm not being rude, for the third time, would you do it? We also have, as you know, engaged with the ODC, and again, that's evidence of the number of processes that we've put in place 
to undergo to undergo a thorough examination. Okay, well, I think I think I have your answer there. Yeah, I think you do. That deserves to hang for about twenty seconds of radio silence. Mm-hmm. So O'Dowd then uh, made another point about the lack of transparency in the way the FAI does its business. And I, t- I just want to say, if you start at the very basic unit of accountability, is it a fact that your organisation, that your AGM, that nobody can ask a question? That's not true. Now, that's in your rule book, I believe. Uh, and, that's and, not in our rule book. It, well, I've been told it is. Uh, that that you, you, must give, you must give prior notice of a question. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So you can't ask a question unless you say it beforehand. So if I go to your AGM and I want to say, hey, what about, what, what about the 100,000? Well, you, you can't ask that question. If I ask about governance, I can't ask that question. So I'm just really getting at the point of accountability. And I also just want to mention, you mentioned rightly all the young people that, that play your sport, and rightly so, and it's fantastic. Tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of people love your sport every day, every week. Their, their families are dedicated to kids just love it. We all know that, and we love to see them participating in it. But the question is, they now have no money. They now have no money coming in the next tranche because you have not satisfied Sport Ireland in relation to your governance. That's the truth of all this. So those children that you rightly enumerate and talk about are being deprived of the support that we want to give them as taxpayers. So my question is, what are you going to do about it? What changes, what governance changes are you going to bring about? We talk about 2021. Now the reality is, who would have anything to do with an organisation that the state is refusing to fund on governance grounds? So the question is, you know, what changes are you going to bring about? With, with respect, uh, Chairman, the Sport Ireland has suspended funding. Yeah. And we will be, as we committed at last Friday's meeting with them, engage with Sport Ireland. Sport Ireland will know the terms of reference of our independent review. Sport Ireland will have the findings and the full report of that independent review. That was the end of his answer. Mm. So that's your morning session. And uh, bleary-eyed, we went off for lunch for an hour and 15 minutes, and then we came back. Afternoon session, a bit more bite, I think. So Catherine Murphy had a conversation with the FAI honorary treasurer, Eddie Murray, who had said nothing until that point. She accused the board of being completely passive. He denied that. He then had to uh, discover that the FAI, in fact, has 24 bank accounts. He thought it was closer to one. That was FAI honorary treasurer. And then, and I've deliberated over playing this or not, but it was a memorable part of the day. So we'll just get through it and then move on. Step forward, Michael Healy Ray. Uh, let me emphasize that Michael Healy Ray is not even a member of the Oireachtas Committee, but he deemed it worthy of his time and therefore your time to sit in all day long and wait for his turn. So he sat through all that morning. It's uh, the best use of his time and your time to uh, make the following contribution. This is not the full contribution, but you'll get the gist. I would have no doubt, Mr. Delaney, that if you would do time back, maybe this whole issue should have been dealt with a different way. But I think I'd be quite confident in saying that the only thing that you could be accused of is being passionately uh, committed to your job, passionately committed to the survival of, I'll call it the business, if you know what I mean by that, Uh, that all you were trying to do was do good. And, uh, of course, there has to be proper governance, there has to be proper accountancy practices, but I really can't see for the life of me uh, if... Uh, the three reports will come back in a positive way, which will allow for the funding to come in. You were questioned here today, or sorry, your president was questioned about your suitability to be the executive vice president. I think th- that your uh, work ethic back over the years will show th- that you were eminently qualified and most definitely the best qualified person for this new role that has been created for continuity, for dealing with FIFA, for dealing with UEFA. I know that certainly firsthand, and it would be very remit of me, Chairman, not to mention this, uh, because we're hearing a lot of other stuff today, but the stuff that I'd like to remember is what you have done up and down the length and breadth of this country for the association, from every club, from the grassroots up, locally, nationally and internationally. Your personal uh, reputation is second to none, in my humble opinion. 
Okay, people can look. Jeopardy has one minute left. People can look at what has. <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe, maybe what I'm saying, Chairman, doesn't suit other people, but I'm going no, to no, say no, it. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, with, Jeopardy. With it's the, the rules. Sorry. Yes. Just, just, to, just. Well, you're eating too long. No, no, time no, now, not mine. No, 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 no. I want to be very fair. To, sorry. No, no, no. I think I want to try. And, Let me ask I'm some sorry. questions of them. We can't Did I question you? Like Did I? Did I, I question you? I think, no, you're meant uh, to be asking questions yeah. of them. I'm sorry. I, I, I was supposed to be asking questions of them, but not directed at me. Yeah. At the end of this month, Mr Delaney is to come to Castle Island AFC to, to open the new George O'Callaghan Park. 45 years they wanted for this park to be there. And what I'm reliably told, that if it wasn't for John Delaney and the FAI, that park wouldn't be being opened at the end of this month. You will be most welcome to Kerry. You will get what I would call the mother of all welcomes when you come to Kerry, because your reputation and your respectability will precede you down the road before you land, and we will be there to welcome you. Okay. And all I can say is that, OK, when it comes to the accountancy practices, Chairman, and I'm sure you appreciate this, many of us in business who have to do certain things at certain times, during the recession, people bailed out their own small businesses, they did different things that they had to do okay, to try and be of help and assistance. Point. And if you're I guilty of anything, think, you're yeah. guilty of trying to help an association okay. in the best way you saw fit at that time. Sure, surely John Delaney won't be in Kerry for that pitch opening. It's hardly part of the remit of an executive vice president, is it? <laughs> I thought he just dealt with international yeah. affairs. Yeah. It's a bit too parochial for him, is it? That is a good point. He may make an exception, I suspect, mm. for this one. Mm. We'll move on from that. Please. Like Michael Healy Ray obviously represents people and therefore should be heard, but he does, and it really bugs me, he receives a disproportionate amount of coverage mm. across the media. And it's something actually the media needs to think about because it just diminishes... Yeah, I agree. Like, all. he went there today because he knew it, w w it, would, it would get him headlines. And he's tweeting about it, oh, I see I've annoyed the hurlers in the ditch. He knew that. Yeah. It's deliberate. It's so, it's so transparent we shouldn't be giving him any time to be honest. Well, we've given him enough time. I know we have. Yeah. I saw him with Ivan and Matt Cooper talking about climate change a couple of months ago. And genuinely, <sighs> the level of misinformation was such yeah. that you wonder, really, the media just need to think about how much they're using people like Michael Healy Ray. I, would, I appreciate he probably engages an audience, but... Yeah, uh, got 20,000 votes, believe it or not. I do believe it. Yeah. I do believe it. So look, that was the, pretty much the sum total of Michael Healy Ray's uh, contribution today. Now next to a potentially significant point. So it was never really developed, and this ties in with something you mentioned earlier, Kieran. So this John Delaney Executive Vice President role was recommended by the Jonathan Hall report. And in that report, as you know, it recommended at the very end, despite being very vague all the way through initially, at the very end, it recommends a timeline whereby the board would meet on the 22nd of March, which was the day before the Gibraltar game, to copper fasten the Delaney move. And then on the day of the game, the 23rd, it was recommended in the Jonathan Hall Associates report that the uh, board make the announcement. So the FAI maintained this was long in the planning. Noel Rock here had a point to make on the matter uh, in relation to this Jonathan Hall report. Just one final question, okay. Chair, if you'll just indulge me. The PDF that you sent us of the Hall report, when was that received? That would have been the document that was, the very same document that was presented to the board that was accepted? I think so, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rock. No, it's just interesting because the data on the document itself is from the next day. Um, the document, it says, was created at ten past five the following day on the Saturday uh, during the Ireland-Gibraltar match. Uh, this all seems quite peculiar to me and seems to warrant maybe a further line of questioning with regard to the creation of the report. Which we never got. No, no, no this is very interesting because there was an FEI board meeting on 22nd of March and this is when they said that um, they discussed the implementation of the Hull report or the recommendations of it. And as he says, the PDF is from 24 hours later yeah. when it was created. Yeah. So that is definitely something that's to be explored further. Like Noel Rock has, um, has been very vocal about all this lately. And I can see, in a, uh, I think he's made a lot of valid points, but also politically it's going to help him because he's, his constituency boundaries have been redrawn. He's going to be in a dogfight for the last seat in that uh, constituency. So it's helping his profile, but he's still making some valid points and asking valid questions. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what's going on there, but it had the, the parallel of a Lance Armstrong backdated prescription. <laughs> yeah. Next to Robert Go Troy. Ahead. So at this stage, it's becoming very apparent that John Delaney is not going to say much and that 
answer after answer was proving very uh, difficult. So Robert Troy just voiced a general frustration with how the day was going. On your opening address, uh, Mr Conway, you say, I know we have much work to do to rebuild trust and confidence in the association and we are committed to achieving this as a board. Can I say this is your opportunity to start that process? This is your opportunity, even if you have no time for us members that are gathered around here. You can speak to your patrons who are watching in with huge interest in what's going on here. But since this morning you have been evasive, evasive vague, non-committal, ambiguous in your replies. You have chosen to answer what you wish to, to answer. And I give you an example. We asked in relation to a severance package. You chose to answer that because it suited you to answer that. But when I asked in relation to a pension, you slapped down and you said, I'm not in a position to answer that. It's contractual arrangements. You are hiding behind the Grant Thornton report. You are hiding behind Mazar's report. And can I just ask you, can you be honest and upfront with the general public who have a right to know in terms of how corporate governance is being administered in the FAI? You know, it's a, it's a case of deja vu. Mm. Mm. And incidentally, we learned today that the Grant Thornton report will just be for FAI eyes only. We hadn't realised that, but it seems it will just be for the FAI. Robert Troy, by the way, then went on to say this a few moments later. Seven of your current board members have 103 years services, service uh, to the board. And I think the perception outside um, Mr Conway is the board is a cartel, a cartel. That you are closing rank and that you are not being honest and open um, with the public. So we've got to take a short break. There are a few more uh, short clips I want to bring you, one including Imelda Munster and John Delaney getting into a bit of a tetchy exchange and some other key uh, finishing points from Fergus O'Dowd and Ruth Coppinger. And Mark Daly asked some interesting questions about the uh, bank accounts. So bear with us, short break, and then final few clips, which will sum up the afternoon session. Off the ball on News Talk. The Pat Kenny Show. On tomorrow's programme, as well as all the breaking news, we hear from the residents in the most polluted town in Ireland, the doctor who delivered Satan's child and saved the woman who swallowed a fish, and Minister Pascal Donoghue will join us in studio. The Pat Kenny Show. With MasterCard. Tomorrow morning at nine. On News Talk. Business is changing, which is why at Ford, when we say our commercial vehicles are built for business, we mean it. Our new transit range is still tough, still powerful and always dependable. But it now has the brains to match its superior brawn. With an even wider range of innovative features, smart technologies and greater efficiency, it's designed to work as hard as you do. And with Ford Innovate driving better value, you can get 3.9% APR, a five-year warranty and a 2,000 euro bonus on the new Ford Transit range. Your business deserves the best in the business. Choose Ford Transit, the future of commercial vehicles. Order now at your local participating Ford dealer and register by April 30th. Ford, go further. Terms and conditions apply. See Ford.ie for details. At Easy Living Interiors, we've sprung some incredible savings in our Spring Interiors event. That plush velvet sofa, it's going to look stunning in your sitting room. The Italian designer dining set, it will give your kitchen a whole new look. And the super king bed with pocket sprung mattress, you'll wonder how you ever slept on anything else. Save on all your favourites and accessories at the Spring Interiors event, now on at Easy Living Interiors. Cork, Waterford, Nava, Nace, Sandyford and Drogheda. Sale now on. In case you haven't heard, Multitrip.com Travel Insurance is offering customers a chance to win a brand new car from Toyota Sandyford. They're picking one finalist every month to attend a grand final at the end of the year. The lucky Multitrip.com March finalist is... Gareth O'Regan from Limerick. Congratulations, Gareth. So, if you need travel insurance this year and you fancy winning a car in the process, visit multitrip.com now. Terms and conditions apply. Blue Insurance Limited, trading as multitrip.com, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. When you want to stay somewhere, don't sit on the fence. You'll stay in a travel lodge when you hear the evidence. Great rooms, big beds, locations. 
This place has it all And for such amazing value Let's travel Visit Travelodge.ie And it all comes down to this The winning parts of the Dubai duty-free Irish Open Come experience all the excitement of this year's Dubai duty-free Irish Open at the spectacular Le Hinch Golf Course from the 3rd to the 7th of July. Watch the drama unfold as Larry, Fleetwood and Harrington take to this dramatic and challenging Lynx course. Experience more with a fantastic festival of golf, live music and delicious food and drink. DubaiDutyFreeIrishOpen.com Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Now you're very welcome back. So it's uh, Joe Malloy here, Kieran Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star alongside me. We have sat through the seven hours of the Oireachtas Committee, so you don't have to. That's the tagline of this hour. We're nearly there. In the football show, we'll do some analysis and get some thoughts from Fergus O'Day, who's going to come into studio. And obviously Man United Barcelona will be on. And in the next hour, we'll surround you with master's goodness. But we just want to bring you a good sense of what happened today because we appreciate that not all of you will have been able to see it. If you're just tuning in now, we're going to have a podcast of this full hour. The best thing to do might be to go back and listen to it to get a proper sense, but you're more than welcome to stay on. So this is afternoon session now, deep into the afternoon session. And as you know, if you were listening all the way through, John Delaney said he was precluded from discussing the 100,000 euro loan for legal reasons, but also that he was precluded from answering any questions to his previous role for legal reasons, his previous role being his 14 years as CEO, which left not much in the way of uh, items he could be uh, questioned about. We played you just before the ad break, uh, Robert Troy saying the thing was like a cartel and that generally there was a massive frustration in the room with the FAI not answering any questions about various matters. So that ties in here with Imelda Munster. And there was this exchange with John Delaney, one of the few exchanges John Delaney got into. And I appreciate we're on radio here, but I think if looks could kill, uh, I don't think that the FAI's Executive Vice President, John Delaney, enjoyed this line of questioning, we'll say that much. Can I just say, just to my observation, Chair, I think, you know, that the former CEO has, has, has behaved disgracefully today. I mean, he came in with a last minute statement. He knows the procedures for this committee. He's furnished us with the statement, but refusing to answer any questions in relation to the statement. And he's, he's also refusing to answer questions that are ongoing in relation to his time as CEO. And I would have imagined, it's an absolute disgrace and it's been farcical what's gone on here. But the only good thing is that the public out there have witnessed it firsthand too. And I would have thought that anybody would have been glad to be handed the opportunity to put the record straight. But you haven't taken up that opportunity, Mr. Delaney. I know what your is there a reason why you haven't? Yeah. No, I know what your comments, Deputy Muster. But is there a reason you haven't? No, I've read my statement, as you know. Mm. That was a tetchy moment. Yeah. I didn't enjoy that. I've read my statement, <clears throat> as you know. Yeah, the, no, there was a couple of those with him. There was a Luke he gave the treasurer, Eddie Murray, when. Um, I can't remember the exact words he used, but he, he basically said it was unusual uh, the, or the circumstance around the loan for something like this to happen, not be aware of it. So uh, and he gave, there was a glance across. So uh, he had a legal advisor behind him, John Delaney, by the way, so brought him with him there, which is unusual. Next clip. Earlier on, we mentioned to you that the FAI were asked how many bank accounts they have and their honorary treasurer seemed to think they had one account. And then after a period of consultation, it turned out they have 24 accounts. And that was made clear after a time. So here is Senator Mark Daly, who, by the way, we didn't have time to play the clip. He did not have a stellar performance in the morning. It would be fair to say. Mark he wasn't Taylor. a mad buzz. He seemed to be enjoying himself. He seemed to think <laughs> everything was great. Um, he seemed to want to go down the lines. Uh, well, he asked a reasonable question about the logistics of checks, which was fair enough. But then it wasn't answered, and he just let that go. It was a really frustrating moment because it was it, it was a question which should have been answered. But he went straight from that question into it, talking about how gender equality, a tangent, how women would sort out Brexit, even though there's a woman prime minister I mean, in honestly, Britain, which it, I think you might have forgotten. It was the most twee thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah if, if a woman was involved in Brexit, it'd be all be sorted out. And he talked about the GA, the GA, which by the way is a separate entity to the ladies' GA. Yeah. Mark, I'm sure you've realised that subsequently, but. Uh, you did redeem yourself somewhat in the evening session, in fairness. You asked a very good question later on, yeah. 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 So Mark Daly here with questions. And 
we don't get much information here, but it will just give you a sense of how painstaking it was and why you've heard other representatives really voice frustration. So this is Mark Daly trying to get to the bottom of this 100,000 euro loan. Who was the creditor? Who was owed money? You know, just just give us some information here. Everybody in the room, you know, people in the room here know the answers to those questions. So it's a good indicator of just the frustration or the wall that the TDs and senators met on a regular basis. So my concern here is that you had loads of money in other accounts, but it didn't appear to add up to 100,000, or you had other commitments for that money. But could you outline how long was the money owed, the 100,000 owed, how long did you have to pay it, and what was that 100,000 for that you had to pay? Like, was it infrastructure? Was it a, a bill to some contractor? Was it, was it a club? Was it money due for a competition? Jonathan uh, alluded to that. What was that for? There were a number of outstanding checks. No, there's one check. And no, no, sorry, just a no. current here that you got an email um, the day after you were looking for the money. Oh, there was there was a one. Yeah, sorry, go on. Send there was it. one check, and you knew it was coming. My question again is, how long did you know it was coming for? How long did you have to pay it? How long, like, were you legally obliged to pay it? Like, how is it that the the money, the check was made available by the former CEO? It was put there, ready to be used if it came down. Did it have to be paid by that Friday? Did it have to be paid the following week? Had you a month to pay it? Like, what, what were the terms of credit? If Alex maybe have an answer to that in terms of what was the terms of credit for that 100,000 that was due? The... Sorry, to Alex, do you know? I don't have that answer. Okay. Alex wasn't in the organisation. Oh, no, but hey, let's, you know, he's in we're coming account. to a committee meeting here. We're asking about 100,000 that we knew was due there was no other money available in the end, other accounts, and yet you can tell us today what it was for. What was it for infrastructure? What, what was that money for? That one single bill. The cheque was lodged. The cheque was written to try to prevent a breach of overdraft. No, no, I'm not saying it what wasn't was it for. Tracking I'm saying what the bill, how, who was the bill due to? Like, what was it? Was it a club? Was it infrastructure? Was it a wage? I, I, I can't go into that, Senator. No, no, you can. It's, it does, excuse me. I'm not asking you who it was due to. I'm asking you what it was for. Okay, we're looking at you. Major question. No, no, I'm just asking. No, no, you've made your question. No, but my, I'm asking what was it for? <clears throat> yeah. The bridging loan was to attempt to prevent a breach of over. No, no, I'm not asking what the bridging loan was for. I'm saying the 100,000 bill that you had to pay that you knew was coming. What specifically, in terms of, I'm talking about, was it infrastructure? Was it a club that was due money? And what was the terms of payment? Did it have to be paid by that Friday or the following month? I do 28 days, terms of credit. It was Tuesday to issue a rose. Uh, oh, no, but Friday like, it was paid, it's not it. Yeah, but it yeah. Does, it, what it doesn't make clear is <clears throat> when did they yeah. have to have it paid? Well, the financial controller lodged, lodged the checks, so he must have had concern that a payment to demand had to be met. Yeah, but I'm, we're, we're, again, I'm not... To be in liquid, are you... No, what they're, what they're not the able to tell us... the danger of a breach of overdraft. Yeah, sorry, Chair. What they're not able to tell us today is what exactly that 100,000, the terms and conditions for the, for the person who was owed the money, did they have to be paid by that Friday or did they have... Did the FAI have 28 days to pay it? Like, what was the terms of credit in relation to that specific bill? Anybody know? I, I can't answer the issue of that creditor on what the terms But, like, that's what we're here for. Like, I mean, literally all well, the questions are about the... That's uh, Fianna Fáil Senator Mark Daly. Trying to press them, in fairness, trying to go at them, and that is an edited clip. Yeah. That was a long six, seven minutes yeah. of just torturous <clears throat> back and forth, and it was just a simple question. I'm not asking you for specifics. Just give us a basic, and it what is was the, it for? It is the key question. Like, this is what... Uh, a lot of the questioning of Jonathan O'Brien, who, who, who used to be involved with Cork City, was about as well. Because a lot of people within the League of Ireland know this, that there's often been delays in paying prize money or money from UEFA been passed on. So that leads to legitimate questions. Is that what was, was the case? Is that what, was, did this, was this money owed to a club? Was that why this issue arose? But the straight answer wasn't given. No. And like, why wasn't the straight answer given? And also, a very important, I don't know if you have a clip on this, Padraig Okeji. Have you put any clips of him? He didn't make the cut. No, but the, there's one very good line of him is worried because they make great play of this ab about Sport Ireland funding isn't that big a deal to them because of a 50 million turnover and this is only 2.7 million, whatever. 
But he said, if you're down to 100 grand with a 50 million turnover, I tell you, I'd be worried, yeah. which is a very valid point. Yeah, you know. yeah. No, okay, you got a few good points about the general governance, but uh, we just didn't have time to fit everything in. Yeah. So look, last two, last two. At this stage, it's getting close to six o'clock. It feels like everybody in the room is on holiday in a caravan and it's day 13 of their two weeks and everybody has cabin fever. So things begin to wrap up. Chair of the committee, Fergus O'Dowd, he gave some final thoughts to the FAI and it just led to this more human exchange, I think, with the FAI president, uh, Donald Conway. This is our second last clip. I just, uh, the picture in my mind is of all those young people, of them going out to play this evening and Saturday and, you know, their parents with them, driving them, buying them football boots and going through the, the, the tough life of a parent looking after young children. And I just need to say that to you. And that's the message I have to give you from the people that, that, that talk to me. And I appreciate you listening to me. Can I make a remark? Oh, yeah, I want you to make a remark at the end. Yes. If you okay. want to make it now. I, I don't know, you can respond to my, you can, of course, yeah. Excuse me, sorry. You know, none of us have a divine right to be on the board. None of us ever thought we had a divine right to be on the board. Mm -hmm. We only came to the board through our clubs, exactly. our affiliates, yeah. our respective committees. And every two years, if not every year, they had to endorse us. Absolutely. So it wasn't a case that you find yourself at a board table and thereafter Except you are that. forever on the board table. Except that. That, that. That's not the case. We're volunteers. No, that's not, that can be misinterpreted when I say that. But we're, we're volunteers invested in the game that we love and we support and we want to prosper. We're in the game 30, 40, 50 years. Now, if that doesn't give you a right, I want to just make that clear. That gives you no right to sit on a board endlessly or whatever. But the children you talk about are the children we're in this game for. And from the children, right through, whether it's the amateur women's game, men's game, the boys' game, the girls' game. That was the commitment we've made, and that's the commitment that still keeps us here. But your actions have resulted in the funding for those very people <coughs> being withdrawn. That's the point I'm making. Yeah, it was uh, a good response from the chair of the committee, Fergus O'Dowd, who'll join us after nine o'clock for a few minutes to reflect on the day. Final clip then, because the clock is against us. Uh, they went round the room after that for a general summary from different people, and I think Ruth Coppinger, uh, summed up the mood of the room best. Today's proceedings are going to uh, reaffirm people's cynicism about the political process and about uh, the FAI. Uh, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say that I have family members who have been connected with the FAI. But you've come along here today uh, armed with lawyers and legal advice um, we, we did not bring legal sorry, advice. I was just about, well, you obviously got legal advice before you came we did. here, we did. and you've given the most minimal answers sorry. that fit in with that. Well, but we've also. And they're entitled to, to do that. Yeah, uh, they're, they're entitled to do it, and I was just I'm, about to say that. Um, yes, but yeah, we got legal advice as well. That it would appear Mr. Delaney, like he's here physically, so he's covered himself in that way but it's Hamlet without the Prince because he hasn't answered any of the questions that people outside of this room would have wanted to be answered. And uh, I hope journalists and I hope the general public take note of how toothless the Parliament has become because of legal threats. Um, now, the board was fooled or misled by a number of people on the board who never told them about these transactions and about the shortfall. And Sporting Ireland also had information hidden from us by the FAI because um, they, they did ask, they told us in 2017, and they were told all was well in, in, at that time. And it seems that, the final thing I'd say, the board has moved Mr Delaney aside um, because of his connection to UEFA, they're willing to, to, to keep him. And they've created a role solely for one person, nobody else need apply. And uh, it, it's a position that's still, you know, quite well paid. As I said, this, it's similar to the prize money for the entire Deputy Irish League. O'Brien, I have to take Deputy O'Brien. So I, I just think that yeah. this has been very frustrating for a lot of people. And okay, Deputy O'Brien. Changes need to be made. And yeah, Ruth Coppinger there. That's the last of the clips for now. A quick break. Back in a sec. Off the ball on News Talk. 
As the dog of the house, I know exactly what my family are thinking. Right now, they're convinced I am upset they're heading off on holidays. Me? Upset? Yeah, right. They have AA travel insurance, so I won't have to worry about them while I'm living it up with the neighbour's French poodle, Fifi. Ooh la la. Go to the AA.ie and get annual travel insurance from only sixteen ninety nine, and you're even covered before you go. Who's got clever travel insurance? Value price covers one adult under 50 to Europe holding private medical insurance. Price excludes one euro 50 handling fee. AA insurance is tied to interpartner assistance for the purpose